Namaste. So now I want to introduce the second adhyaya or chapter of the Katha Upanishad. And in this chapter, death begins his exposition of the Supreme Truth. And the Supreme Truth is defined in Bhagavad Gita as Jnanam te hung sa vijnanam idang vakshyam yasheshataha yaj gyatva neha bhuyon yaj gyatvyam avashishyate. I shall now declare unto you in full this knowledge, both intellectual and experiential, knowing which there shall be nothing further to know. So the term Adhyatma Yoga appears in verse 12 of the second chapter, where he says, Adhyatma Yoga Digamena. And uh, Shankaracharya defines it as concentration of the mind on the self after withdrawing it from the outer objects is Adhyatma Yoga. And if we look in the Sanskrit dictionary, we find a wealth of material on this term. Um, let me just read a few things here. The primary definition is the Supreme Spirit, own or belonging to self, with a capital S. The Supreme Spirit manifested as the individual self, or the relation between the Supreme and the individual. Concentration of the mind on the Atman, drawing it off from all objects of sense. That's the definition Shankara uses here. And finally, one who delights in the contemplation of the Supreme Spirit, which is really the most delightful thing there is. But we'll get to that. <laughs> First of all, how do we get there? How do we get to this contemplation of the Supreme? By withdrawing the mind from the senses, right? Good old pratyahara. Huh? In Ashtanga Yoga, there's yama, niyama, then asana, pranayama, breath control. And the very next step is pratyahara. Now, I have never found someone who claims to be teaching yoga, uh, or especially Ashtanga Yoga, who can teach how to withdraw the mind from the senses. And actually, the clue is given here in this Upanishad. And it requires a little intelligence, huh? which is maybe why the typical yogis don't get it. <laughs> because it's rather subtle. And death says that. This is a subtle subject matter, and even the gods have trouble with it. Even the devas find it difficult to understand. So what to speak of common people, you know, who just call yoga the asanas alone? Actually, the whole yoga system is one thing, and either you should know the whole thing or just leave it alone. They're taking one thing, just the asanas, and teaching that as yoga? That's a gross distortion, and I think it's a fraud. So, to withdraw the mind from the senses, you have to understand the difference between the Atma, Brahman, the self, and the individual objects and things that we see in the material world. What is the difference? Well, we went over that in our recent video, what is, is, what ain't, ain't. And basically, in a nutshell, Atma, or the self, or Brahman, alone, really exists because it's eternal and changeless. It's unlimited. It has no boundaries, no qualities, no actions. It's not an actor. It's not an agent. It doesn't do anything. Huh? Doesn't produce any results. Doesn't produce any byproducts. <laughs> it just is. 
And because it is unconditionally existing like that, its existence is the only real existence. Everything else, its existence is derivative of Brahman. Why is that? Because it's temporary. It begins at a certain time, lasts for a while, and then disappears. Isn't it? Everything that we perceive is like that. Even this material universe, although it lasts for a very long time, eventually is destroyed by the dance of Shiva, the Tandava, Shiva Tandava. And he burns it to a crisp, he burns it to ashes. Uh, that's why when we put on the Tripundra, we say a little prayer, the earth is ashes, air is ashes, water is ashes, fire is ashes, even Space is ashes. The mind, the body, thoughts, everything is ashes because that's its final state. That's what happens at the end. So if everything is ultimately ashes, why should we be attached to it? Well, the thing is, we want things to exist, to be real, so badly that in different states of conditioned consciousness, we identify them as being real, even though they're not. For example, in Jagrat consciousness, we think that the body is real, that the objects of the senses are real, that the process of cause and effect is real, huh? that the individual ego self with a small s, is real, and so on. We want to believe in these things so bad that we even take complete abstractions like corporations, nations, religions, and so on, and we think of, of them as real things, as real objects that have real existence, but they don't. Why? Again, because they come into existence at a certain point persist for some time, and then disappear. So this is not real existence. This is conditioned existence, derivative existence. And it's called reflected because it's derived from Brahman. In other words, the material world is illusion. Like the rope and the snake, Brahman is the rope. It's real. The snake is something we hallucinate, <laughs> we project, overlay. We manifest it by a, an act of imagination. That's why it's called avyaya, superimposition. So we superimpose our vision, our idea, on the actual reality, and then we call that reality and we respond to it and act as if it's real. So everybody is walking around like in a hypnotic trance, dreaming that things like my name, my family, my country, my job, uh, my house, my car, my this, my that, are all real. But they're not because they're temporary. See? These illusory things have three qualities that the Buddha talked about. They're temporary or impermanent. They're suffering or unsatisfactory. And they're not self because they are perceived by the self. The self cannot perceive itself. The self is only perceiver, watcher. But that which perceives is never that which is perceived. That's why we can't see consciousness. That's why we can't see Brahman. That's why we can't see that which really exists because it's only subjective. It's never, ever objective. If it were, it wouldn't be the absolute. It wouldn't be absolutely real. It would be one of the phenomenal objects temporary, 
impermanent, suffering, imperfect, and not self. So then, Brahman is that which is really real. It is permanent. It never comes into existence. It always exists. And it never goes out of existence. It's eternal. It's perfect. Because it never changes. It has no qualities, so there's nothing to change. It performs no actions because it's not an actor. It has no objects to act on. It simply is the subject, the universal subject. And finally, it is the self. The self of all living beings, including you and me. <laughs> so, when we load this view into our intelligence, and we start to see that the existence, the consciousness, and the beauty or joy that we perceive in objects is simply borrowed, simply reflected from Brahman. Brahman is Satchit Ananda, absolute existence, absolute consciousness, absolute bliss. And so all of the apparent existence, consciousness, and bliss that we perceive in various objects is simply a reflection of Brahman. There's a beautiful verse in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uritertang yat pratiyeta na pratiyeta chatmani tadvidyad atmano mayam yatabhaso yatatamaha O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. So, when we see things, these objects that appear in the darkness of the material world, they are only a reflection of the reality, which is Brahman. Just like the snake, in the example, uh, is simply a reflection of the rope. It's not really the rope. And in fact, it doesn't even really exist at all. We simply project it. We imagine it. Huh? Its only reality is an illusion. It's a real illusion. It's a real mirage. It's a real hallucination. Huh? Terence McKenna wrote a book one time, Real Hallucinations. <laughs> That's very apt. So the objects that we see, that we experience in the material world that seem to be separate from us are actually simply illusions, dreams, and their reality is reflected reality of the Supreme Self, Brahman. We sometimes hear about the light of Brahman, but that's not an ordinary light, like the sun or like an electric light or something like that. The light of Brahman is existence. So when something is illuminated by Brahman, it appears to exist. But like any object being illuminated by a light, it's actually only reflecting the light. Huh? You might see a little reflection on my cheek here of the light coming in the window. So the light is not illusion based on the actual existence in Brahman. And if we see like that, we automatically become detached. And that is the beginning of Adhyatma Yoga. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.